I am coming from the Northeast, and uh, one of the things that called my attention uh, in the late 90s when I became a, a, a neurologist in, at John Hopkins was that there was a large population of patients with uh, a very complicated neurological disorders, either myelitis or neurological problems that resemble multiple sclerosis that didn't fit clearly the profile of an acute uh, syndrome associated with myelitis or the typical relapse remitting form of uh, multiple sclerosis. And so what I started paying attention uh, since that moment was to a, a group of disorders that are very similar to what we know as myelitis or multiple sclerosis, but are not necessarily those uh, disorders, but fit more in, in a pattern of uh, other systemic diseases. One of those diseases is sarcoidosis. I don't know if, uh, if some of the people here have been affected by sarcoidosis, but sarcoidosis is a very rare disease based on epidemiological studies. Uh, interestingly, in the northeast uh, portion of the United States is uh, uh, relatively frequent, and it's relatively frequent in the African-American population, or uh, Caucasian population from uh, northern, northern European uh, descent. So it's a disease that we call a granulomatose disorder, and it's a granulomatose disorder because uh, there is, it's a particular histological feature that defines the disease that I will show you in a few seconds. It's a, the, the cause of the disease is unknown, and as was mentioned before, uh, some people classify this disease as rheumatological disorder, other pe people classify this as an autoimmune disorder, uh, the, the bottom line is that we don't know what is the cause of the disease. There is some uh, concerns that this may be an infectious disorder, uh, 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 but uh, uh, the reality is that we don't know. Now, the main issue with this disease is frequently it's a systemic disease that uh, affects mostly the, the lungs, lymph nodes, and frequently may affect skin and uh, ocular structures. Um, this is a disease that uh, is associated with uh, pulmonary pathology and pulmonary symptoms, and frequently patients present with uh, chronic coughing, uh, present with fatigue and difficulties with breathing, and frequently have other systemic manifestations that, like weight loss. Now, the main feature of this disease is in the lungs and the lymph nodes, the Disease is characterized by the presence of accumulation of cells, predominantly macrophages and predominantly inflammatory cells that produce a, a typical feature of what we call granuloma, meaning that it's a multinuclear giant cell that is one of the characteristics for establishing the diagnosis of this disease. I mentioned before there are some concerns that this disease may be associated with a chronic inflammatory process associated with infection. And there are some description of uh, some studies that describe the presence of uh, mycobacteria in uh, some PCR analysis of the uh, lymph node tissues and, and lung tissues. Uh, but again, we don't know and we are not sure exactly that we are dealing with a chronic uh, uh, infection disorder. Uh, there are interesting observations based on epidemiological studies in the United States. Uh, we know very well that there is familiar clustering, and this is a, a, a finding that, uh, from a epidemiological point of view, may suggest that there is an infectious uh, factor that is associated with, with the problem, or there is a genetic susceptibility to this uh, disorder. Uh, there are other uh, findings, uh, uh, epidemiological findings, that suggest that there are some activities. For example, uh, there is an increased uh, frequency of sarcoidosis in uh, farmers. So this may point out that there are environmental factors that are associated with the disorder. As I mentioned before, it's very clear that uh, African-American population is uh, greatly affected as compared with Caucasian population, and Nordic uh, Caucasians are uh, greatly affected by this disease. Uh, the disease affect overwhelming the, the, the lungs and lymph nodes and in a relatively low percentage of cases, based on a study that was done in the late 90s, affects the central nervous system. So approximately between 5 and 10 percent of patients with sarcoidosis may be affected by uh, uh, neurosarcoidosis. That is the neurological involvement by the disease. 
And this is a disease that is present in all uh, age spectrum, but it's prominently in the middle age where uh, uh, it's uh, going to be affecting uh, patients. And again, it presents like different uh, skin manifestation as part of the systemic involvement. The neurological involvement, interestingly, is more frequent in, in, in women. And uh, the neurological involvement uh, 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 is characterized by different uh, uh, degrees of uh, pathology. For example, we know very well that one of the frequent manifestations is chronic meningitis. But we know also that patients present with myelopathies. And the difference with the acute transfer myelitis is sarcoidosis has tendency to produce subacute or chronic myelopathies, meaning that the, the presence of the symptoms or the progression of the symptoms are very slow. Patients that start having problems with weakness or sensory problems and establish over the course of weeks or even months. And later they are discovered to have a myelopathic uh, problem. Or, present, or patients that present with frequent headaches and they find evidence of meningitis and the patient have meningitis six months later and continue having meningitis on chronic basis. So this is, again, a disease that has tendency to have a very uh, subacute and chronic uh, 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 time progression. There are uh, manifestations in the brain that produce and mimic exactly what happened in multiple sclerosis, produce uh, white matter disorders produce a leukoencephalitis and produce uh, the same uh, characteristic of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis in MRI uh, studies. And other uh, frequent manifestation of the disease is the presence of involvement of, uh, of uh, uh, multiple cranial nerve pathology, meaning that in the neurological exam we find evidence of optic neuritis or evidence of uh, facial paralysis uh, that present almost simultaneously. I mentioned before one of the uh, uh, difficult parts in the diagnosis of sarcoidosis is it may behave clinically in a similar uh, pattern as multiple sclerosis. You may have patients that have acute exacerbations or acute manifestation of the disease, but there are patients also that have the typical relapsing remitting form that we see in multiple sclerosis or have a chronic progressive form. So it's very important to be uh, very careful in the assessment of patients in which we are suspicious about the presence of systemic manifestation uh, and neurosarcoidosis. Let me talk about the most frequent problems that uh, uh, are important for us. And I mentioned before the presence of myelopathy is uh, one of the uh, frequent characteristics of this uh, 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 problem. And the temporal profile is a subacute or progressive myelopathy, chronic myelopathy, evolved over uh, weeks and months, and may produce exactly the same as acute myelopathies. May produce weakness, paraplegia, bladder uh, uh, dysfunction, and produce all of the complex manifestation of uh, sensory system involvement. Uh, the main characteristic on MRI is the presence of a very extensive lesions that are uh, intraaxial affecting the uh, uh, spinal cord compartment, may take different three or four segments of the spinal cord, and are frequently associated with uh, 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 active inflammation and enhancement. Uh, the spinal cord uh, uh, involvement may also uh, be associated with meningitis or chronic meningitis. Uh, this is an example of one patient, for example, that presented subacutely or acutely with an episode of, uh, of a weakness in uh, both upper extremities. And the MRI showed this lesion, and this patient was, was, uh, was taken immediately to the neurosurgeon because there was some concern about a tumor. So the neurosurgeon went to the OR and took a biopsy, and interestingly, the biopsy demonstrated that this patient had a granulomatose inflammation, and later the patient underwent more uh, uh, studies and demonstrated that the patient had not necessarily a tumor, but had an inflammatory uh, 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 and granulomatose reaction that was consistent with uh, uh, neurosarcoidosis. So this is uh, not necessarily a frequent problem in the assessment of uh, of, uh, of acute myelopathies, this again is, has tendency to be uh, more subacute and chronic. This patient was a little bit atypical because present acutely and obviously there was concern about this uh, diagnosis. And again, uh, this is the typical feature, is accumulation of uh, large plasmocytoid cells, macrophages, and formation of granulomatose structures, and that defined the disease. I mentioned that 
uh, this is uh, a problem that presents uh, uh, in 5 to 10 percent of patients with systemic sarcoidosis. But interestingly, patients with neurosarcoidosis, uh, uh, that may be the first manifestation, and in 50 percent of those patients, neurosarcoidosis, either meningeal, encephalitic, or myelopathic form, are the first manifestation of the systemic disease. Now, other frequent form of, of uh, neurosarcoidosis is meningitis. And again, this is a meningitis in, in which there is no evidence by laboratory studies of any infection, either viral or bacterial. And these are meningitis that have tendency to be chronic and produce a very diffuse involvement. And obviously, this is going to be associated with uh, a lot of symptoms, including presence of headaches, presence of hydrocephalus, and uh, uh, may present with a relapsing uh, subacute or relapsing remittent form. Uh, this is an example by MRI. This is uh, the brain, and you can see these white uh, 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 images here around the different areas of the brain. These represent areas of inflammation uh, around the brain structure. This is characteristic of uh, meningitis or leptomeningitis. And this is the same example in this patient that underwent a biopsy in which there was demonstration of inflammation and granulomatose reaction. Now, the disease has, a, again, tendency to be chronic. And occasionally, the chronicity induces changes in the covering of the brain that mimic tumors. And in this patient, for example, uh, there was a lesion that was mimicking a meningioma, that is a tumor that uh, is growing from the covering of the brain, that is the dura mater. And in this particular patient, the, the, the concern was that the patient had a meningioma. He went to the OR, and surprisingly, there was demonstration of sarcoidosis. Again, this was the first manifestation of systemic sarcoidosis, and the patient was later uh, evaluated and, they, and, and was found to have pulmonary sarcoidosis. Now, other form of uh, neurosarcoidosis is multiple cranial nerve uh, involvement, meaning that patients may present in similar way as, mul as multiple sclerosis with optic neuropathy or optic neuritis, but many times uh, this optic neuropathy is associated with other form of cranial nerve involvement like facial paralysis or even involvement of different uh, cranial nerves. So this is based on uh, uh, studies that were done, uh, one of them in Baltimore by uh, Barney Stern, who found that the cranial nerve 7 of the facial nerve was a frequent uh, uh, cranial nerve associated with neurosarcoidosis. And uh, that's obviously one uh, reason to be concerned when we are evaluating patients that have different cranial nerve involvement in clinical assessment. Now, there are other forms of neurosarcoidosis, the encephalitic forms, uh, are very difficult to evaluate sometimes because these are forms that mimic multiple sclerosis. And in my rule of thumb uh, in my clinic at John Hopkins is if I have a patient with multiple sclerosis that is uh, African-American descent or is suspected to have systemic disease, immediately I do a, an assessment to investigate if that patient has sarcoidosis. And that will include evaluation to see if there is pulmonary involvement or lymphadenopathies. And again, these are uh, encephalitic forms that have either uh, focal encephalitis or multifocal leukoencephalitis. Uh, this is an example of one of, the, of them, patient with a clear evidence of a focal uh, 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 involvement, inflammation. But this is a patient, for example, that had a very extensive white matter disease. And it was so extensive that the neurologist who was uh, evaluating this patient uh, immediately it was suspicious that this patient may have a tumor because the pattern of the MRI and, and the pattern of enhancement was suspicious for a tumor that is called glioblastoma. So this patient went to the OR, and surprise, surprise, there was demonstration of, of uh, uh, neurosarcoidosis. Uh, this is another example, a patient with uh, uh, different areas of inflammation in the brain. And uh, these are uh, areas that are characterized by uh, perivascular caffeine, meaning inflammation, uh, these patients have, similarly to multiple sclerosis, uh, accumulation of uh, T cells. They have accumulation of uh, uh, B cells and uh, macrophages. We have the opportunity of studying some of these biopsies that were obtained in uh, at John Hopkins and even uh, other uh, tissues obtained from autopsy. And it's very clear that there is a T cell component characterized by infiltration of uh, by CD4, CD8 cells, 
and there is also a quite a striking accumulation of monocytes, macrophages, and activated microglial cells. And in subset of patients, we have also a very dramatic infiltration by uh, uh, B cells uh, that are here characterized by this marker that is called CD20. So the inflammatory profile of these patients with neurosarcoidosis is very heterogeneous, suggesting that they have both in, in, in evidence of inflammation uh, by uh, T cells and uh, production of antibodies likely uh, by all of these B cells. The bottom line here is many of these patients, uh, and the way to differentiate this patient with other inflammatory disorders is they have this characteristic uh, uh, granuloma cell formation that is the hallmark for, uh, for the disease. And in, uh, in many ways, this is a, a, a disease that is, is treatable, and the uh, response to treatment in more than 50% of the cases is very good, is very positive. And the first line of treatment is the use of uh, IV steroids or prednisone, uh, oral prednisone, and this is based in the pathological evidence that all of these uh, inflammatory reactions are comprised by both T cells, B cells, and obviously that is where uh, the use of steroid treatment is going to be uh, very helpful. Now, what we need to be very careful is when we are evaluating patients with subacute form of myelopathy or even with uh, uh, neurological problems that have a relapse in remitting form, is to make sure that we characterize very well all of these patients and examine if there is any evidence of other uh, associated manifestations. For example, patients with neurosarcoidosis frequently have evidence of endocrinological problems because chronic meningitis have tendency to be localized in areas uh, uh, very uh, close to the pituitary gland, and these patients may have manifestation of, uh, of, uh, of deficiency, hormonal uh, problems, or other type of, of endocrinological uh, uh, problems. Now, this is a little bit complicated uh, diagram, but I want to emphasize that the, the most important part of our treatment approach include uh, uh, the use of IV methylprednisolone that in many ways is very similar to what we do in uh, uh, acute transfer myelitis. So we use uh, methylprednisolone that is followed by a tapering dose of prednisone. One of the differences that we have in terms of uh, in the approach is that we have, uh, we need to maintain this patient a high dose of prednisone for a long time to be able to control the inflammatory process that is going on either in the brain or in the spinal cord. Now, if the treatment is successful, obviously, uh, that, that's it. But if the treatment is unsuccessful, we need to move to other uh, type of approaches that may involve the use of immunomodulatory medications or immunosuppressant medications. So we have patients that are very re uh, uh, refractive to the treatment with prednisone, and in those patients, we need to use medication like uh, uh, immunosuppressants like cyclophosphamide or uh, mycophenolate or CELCEP, or use even more aggressive approaches that may include use the, of radiation therapy or other uh, 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 medications. So what I basically wanted to show you is that in our practice, we see occasionally a group of uh, patients in which there is not necessarily a clear-cut case of multiple sclerosis. There is no a clear diagnosis of myelopathy, and we need to make sure that we rule out all of the other possibilities, uh, and we obviously need to bring uh, 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 the acumen of our clinical skills to make sure that we have the right diagnosis. Uh, it is uh, very interesting, for example, that in our experience at John Hopkins, every time that a patient comes with a myelopathy, we always think about sarcoidosis. I'm not sure exactly if the epidemiologic, epidemiology of the disease in the, in the uh, uh, northwest of the United States is similar, but it's very important to think about these possibilities during evaluation of our patients. Thank you.